Hello and welcome to episode 23 of the DX Mentor, all about wire antennas. Thank you for joining us. I'm Bill, AJB, the DX Mentor. My guests are DX gurus that we can all learn from. In this episode, we will attend a detailed discussion on wire antennas. My guests are Joe, W-A-G-E-X, Mike, W-0-V-T-T, and George, KJ6VU. If KJ6VU sounds familiar to you, that's because George is the host of the Ham Radio Workbench. And I, I want to offer him my sincere thanks for taking time to be on our podcast and on this uh, YouTube version. So let's tune into our gurus and find out what they're discussing. Well, good evening and welcome to the DX Mentor Podcast. I'm Bill, AJB, and, and I am as excited as I've been for any of our podcasts. Uh, the topic tonight is uh, wire antennas and all the various forms that they come in and what it takes to uh, build them and how to get them in the air and, and are they really worth building or not. Um, I've heard guys say, oh, 100 watts in a wire, what can you really do? And, and I think those of us that have been here know that you can really do quite a bit. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And I've got a, a really distinguished panel and I'll go around the, the room here. Joe, would you uh, introduce yourself? We've got Joe, W-A-G-E-X. Well, thanks, Bill. And uh, I'm going to um, have a short introduction of something that most people really don't know about me. I, I started out uh, when I was 14 years old as an SWL and, and I had a little uh, Philco radio. And if anybody ever had one of those, the bandwidth on them is not very much, maybe a quarter inch for the whole 20 meter band. So I played around with that. I'd come home from school uh, every day, sit down. I wouldn't even get a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I would sit down and play with the radio. And, and my uncle, who actually got me started doing all this, he also was an SWL. So he and I really, really became very, very close, very close. So he finally brought me over a, a BC-348. Well, I'm not a very big guy, and of course, being a kid, and I didn't have much muscle at, at that point in time, and I had just one heck of a time turning the band switch that was very, very tight. So I played around with that for several years, printed up some QSL cards, uh, sent them all over the world, uh, guys I heard. Matter of fact, I still have that box of QSL cards that when when I uh, need something to do, I, I look back through those and very, very uh, interesting. And then in 1970, I uh, finally got my technician uh, license and started on 6.2 and 432. And uh, once I got on six meters and, and we had some nice openings into the Caribbean, I was absolutely hooked on DXing. And so we'll finish this story on the next podcast, Bill. <laughs> so stay tuned. <laughs> so stay tuned. Okay. And we, we have a gentleman who's affectionately known in the Southwest DX Association as Minnesota Mike. W0VTT, Mike. Well, good evening to everyone. Um, and yes, I... I am Mike W0VTT, and I do live in Minnesota now. Um, I don't go back quite as far as Joe. I started in 75 at the tender age of 21. Um, wire antennas are, uh, that's a big one for me. The first half of my ham career, that's all I could afford was a simple wire antenna. Piece of wire strung between two trees or out a window to a tree in the backyard. Um, I made my first DXCC with a dipole on the roof of an apartment building in Chicago. Um, I know people who have made the honor roll with, uh, with wire antennas. So uh, I, I think this is a, a very good topic for the, especially for the beginning DXers, beginning hams, and for guys who are stuck in HOAs who can't put up big towers and beams. So I, uh, I, I hope we have a good session tonight. I'm, I'm sure we will. Thank you for that. And we have George, KJ6VU, who is a freshly transplanted to Oregon, if I recall. That's right, Bill. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, yeah, I just recently moved, well, recently, uh, last year, just about a year ago now, from California, where I grew up, lived um, up till last year, and moved now to Oregon, near the Portland area. So uh, yeah, it's been quite quite an adventure. A uh, lot more trails, a lot more uh, poda soda kind of operating, which is kind of the motivation. 
So uh, I've been a ham since 1972, way back, uh, got my novice license and then worked my way up from there. And uh, my most of my HF kind of operating is usually portable um, or from the house, but I've, I only have wire antennas actually at home. So good topic for, for tonight's show. And of course, operating portable, I use only wire antennas. Uh, field day, sometimes we, we go nuts and put up big uh, directional antennas, but uh, my favorite are the wire antennas because they're uh, easy to, to uh, put up and they're very inexpensive. They work really well. So, uh, so why not? And I also um, own a little company making wire antennas called Pectenna. So the Pectenna products are really designed for very portable ultralight kind of operating, whether it's uh, backpacking or field day or uh, camping, travel, et cetera. So I've done a lot of work with wire antennas um, and talked to a whole lot of folks who use them. So I really enjoy that quite a bit. And um, also I'm sure people may have heard my call sign along the way. I also host a podcast as well called the Ham Radio Workbench. And we talk about all things ham radio and technical. And a lot of times uh, we talk about wire uh, antennas or antennas in general and how they work and what the difference is and the pros and cons. So it's a, it's a topic of, of great interest to me. Great. Well, I will tell you, I almost uh, had my insurance agent call you because I was coming up I-71 from Cincinnati and you were doing the um, trivia quiz and the, the column was DX and your team missed a couple of easy ones. And I was like, no, it's Canal Zone. How do you not know that? All of a sudden I realized I'm in the wrong lane. There's a truck behind me. I was like, ah. <laughs> You know, th there's a lot of times when when someone will say something and, and I just know there's people like, you know, raising their fist to the to the speaker like, you know, how could you not know that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, when we got the DX questions on the on the trivia quiz, uh, none of us on our team were really DXers. So, you know, we <laughs> it was pretty embarrassing. <laughs> well, so when we talk about wire antennas, we talk about a whole scope of things. And, and the majority of people I know started out with wire antennas. Um, and the one my dad um, and I put up, uh, strangely enough, one end was secured to the tree, a tree, and the other end went through a pulley to a piece of clothesline that was hooked to a bucket with bricks in it. And it, when the wind would blow, the bucket would go up and down, and then the tree would move, and it kept everything from breaking. So for a long time, I thought that was really hokey, and then I really got the, boy, we had some major storms and nothing broke. So it was really a pretty good idea. So I can't complain too much. Um, so... I'll, I'll start with George is, is the idea of, of what Mike said, you know, you can work a hundred or you, you can get out and, and, and work a number of stations. Is, is that really realistic with a wire antenna? It, it is realistic, but I think it, it's like anything else. The, there's a sliding scale of, of, of ease and you can, you can pile on more techniques to improve the odds of making a lot of contact. So the more power you run, the bigger the antenna, the more you operate, the better your skill set. all of those things, will improve your odds of working more and more DX um, in a shorter period of time. And as you constrain any of that stuff, it becomes harder. So, you know, you run you run uh, 100 watts or you run 10 watts or five watts will like make it harder. You have to be much better at operating. If, if you move from a, let's say a multi-element directional antenna like a big Yagi down to a, a, a low hanging random wire antenna, you're not going to be able to make as many contacts. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you have to be a whole lot more persistent. So I think when I hear people say, oh, you could work the world with five watts and a 10 foot piece of wire, I'm sure somebody has done that. You know, that's not like impossible, but it's not the sort of thing that a brand new ham should be taught, in my opinion, because they're going to think, oh, I just throw a piece of wire in a tree and I could work the world in a, in a weekend, which is completely not realistic. So I, I think I think especially for new hams, you have to really set them up for success and give them some good guidance. Having said that, um, you can work 100 watts with a wire antenna. You can work pretty much the world if you work at it. You know, it's and especially if you operate modes like CW or the digital modes, where you, you have a much higher chance of making contacts. So I, I was talking to a friend of mine recently who made a whole mess of contacts one weekend. DX contacts. It turns out he did all of them on FT8. So I have nothing against that, but there's a big difference between running 100 watts sideband or 50 watts sideband versus the same power level FT8. Well, you're going to make a lot more contacts on FT8. It just, you know, so signal to noise ratios in your favor by a substantial margin. And so you're just going to make more contacts. Anyway, right. that's kind of a long winded answer <laughs> to your question, Bill. 
So Joe, you've had some amazing experience with literally a wire hanging off the balcony. Um, and, and again, I, I agree with George, we don't want to trivialize this. And somebody says, oh, I got 30 feet of solder that I can hang out the window. But but at, at the same time, in, in your setup, when you go to the Bahamas, you, you've done very well. Yes. So what I've been doing lately, uh, uh, guys, when I go to the Bahamas, and it's a family vacation, but I'm not a, a big beach guy, so I pretty much stay inside on, on the radio the, the whole trip. But I I will make a fan dipole. I got two or three of them, George, and and I I have a hook on them on the um, um, on on my loading system, and I just hook it on the gutter of a house. So a couple of places where we've been, that gutter is only eight or nine feet in the air, just a typical ranch house. And then there's another location we go where I'm up about twenty feet. It's a nice open three story house open out the back so i uh, i like wire antennas i'm i'm like you i guess george but i've got 25 acres here so i'm i'm very fortunate in in that respect but but i have uh, uh beams i've got uh, verticals and i've got inverted v's and so i i was trying to get uh uh cocos keeling while ago on 40 meters with an inverted v and uh, I called and called, but I wasn't so lucky. <laughs> so, you know, tomorrow's another day. That's right. So, Mike, one of the things that um, I know you you were keen on and, and you did a little homework on was on the G5 RV, um, which um, I know it's not a classic dipole, but I will tell you, I have two of them in the woods here, you know, opposed to each other. I can't believe on 80 meters well I can work with that thing. So I think I think that's kind of something you've been very familiar with. How does that fit into the whole dipole scenario? Well, it it, it it's a dipole. <laughs> um, I uh, let's back up just a bit. I really like what George said about setting your expectations. Um, and and uh, George, you should replay what you said a couple of times for for new hams because I think that's very very important. Um. And okay, Joe goes to the Caribbean and he works all kinds of stuff with a dipole that's not very high. Well, he's on a Caribbean island. He has salt water right next door. And he has that that uh, uh, Caribbean call sign that uh, whatever country it is, they know those strange call signs add about five or 10 dB to your signal. Yeah. Everybody knows that. Um, but if you can get that simple dipole, my very first antenna was a fan dipole. My, my Elmer said, this is how we're going to make it. My yard wasn't big enough for 80, so we had 40, 20, 15, and 10 pieces of PVC tube to act as the spreaders, um, fed it with Radio Shack coax. Good stuff, right? Yeah. And uh, that's all I had. Uh, I didn't discover the G5 RV until some time later. Um, the G5 RV antenna dates to 1956. Uh, Louis Varney, G5 RV. Well, I, I, no, I, it, it dates back to 1946. It was published in uh, the RSGB bulletin in, in July of 1956. He, um, he's getting out of the army after World War II. He wants a simple antenna that will he can work some DX on 20 meters, but it'll work on all other bands. So the classic G5 RV, 102 feet long, it's a three half wave, um, three half waves on 20 meters. The, uh, the 34 foot open wire line that comes down in the center is a matching section so that you can feed it directly with uh, with 70 to 80 ohm coax, 70 to 80 ohm coax is what they had in Great Britain after the war. So it gives you a good match on that band. And he noted, well, it also works very well on 80 meters. Um, 102 feet is a little short for 80, but again, that matching section coming down the middle uh, uh, gives you a better match. The, the 102 foot length 
is not something that he came up with that um, an antenna of that design had been around since the 30s. And the reason for it was basically as an 80 meter antenna that that you would operate on the harmonics. Um, it th having a hundred foot antenna as opposed to a hundred and thirty foot antenna, uh, you had less impedance variation as you tuned across the bands on the harmonics uh, because it's not exactly a full wave on forty meters, which is an extremely high impedance. Uh, it's a little shorter, so the impedance is more manageable. Uh, so that's, in a nutshell, that's how that design came to be. It was originally designed for 80 meters, or for, I'm sorry, for 20 meters primarily. And then he noted, well, you can work it on other bands, but you need a tuner. And, and of course, in, in the 50s, everybody's using two brakes, and, and they weren't very fussy about the kind of load they saw. You know, you just twiddled the knobs and... Um, you know, you got a good match. So, yeah, the G5 RV is a good antenna. Um, if you get it up a half wave to a full wave, uh, if you were to model it in easy neck on, on some of the higher bands, some of those lobes, you'll have almost as much gain as a two or three element Yagi at a similar height. The advantage of the Yagi, of course, is that you can turn it and that but you know, if you have your two G5 RVs at different angles, you switch between them and hopefully one of them has a lobe in the direction you want. So that's really a very effective setup and a whole lot less money than a tower and a beam. Yeah, and you bring up a good point. My old uh, HW101, I could tune up a doorknob and it really wouldn't complain, right? Nope. So my and flex you, would yep. shut down, but the, boy, the, the 101 would just keep going. So, George, that brings up two things. Uh, uh, Mike mentioned a fan dipole. So for someone who's maybe not sure what that is, what's a fan dipole? And then secondly, there's always seems to be a lot of discussion about the best way to feed it. There's, you know, twin lead, there's coax, there's balance. And so what is your recommendation on how if, if someone's listening and say, oh, I want to put up a dipole, how do I connect to it? Um, good questions. So let's start with what, what's a fan dipole. Uh, let me even step back and say, well, what's a dipole? So a dipole is a is an antenna that is constructed out of two quarter wave elements. So let's take 40 meters, for example, a quarter wave on 40 meters is about 33 feet. So you have two elements, uh, two 33 foot elements uh, that are positioned with the with ends of the two of them close to each other and, and fed in the middle. So you think about your coax, there's a center conductor and there's the shield of the coax or ladder line or whatever you're feeding it with. Let's let's go with coax. So the coax runs up to the antenna and the center conductor of the coax gets attached to one of the 33 foot legs and the shield gets attached to the other leg. Now that works pretty well. The, the uh, characteristic feed point impedance of a half wave dipole uh, is about 72 ohms. It depends on the elevation, but it's approximate. Um, the, the coax is about 50 ohms and the transmitter wants to see 50 ohms. And so it's all kind of close enough. So you could actually hook the coax straight to the wire or whatever the elements are built out of, and it would work just fine. That's a basic dipole. A fan dipole is one where you have multiple pairs of elements for multiple bands. So let's say you want a, a two band dipole. You could put 33 feet on either side for 40 meters. You can put 16 feet on either side for 20 meters and you connect the ends together at the middle where they feed. And as you go out to the ends of the antennas, you have to space them out a bit. So you want some uh, separation between the wires or whatever is making up those elements. So you can keep doing this, keep adding more and more elements. And so typically the most you tend to see is maybe three or four because it otherwise starts to get kind of heavy. So um, you might have maybe 40, 20, 15, 10, or whatever your favorite bands are uh, in a multi-band dipole. The, the advantage of a, of a multi-band fan dipole is that you don't have to have a tuner because everything is looking for about 50, 60, 70 ohms. So it's all close enough. And even a, a radio without a tuner, it's probably going to work fine. Your SWR may be 1.5 to 1 or something. You know, it's going to be pretty darn close. So it, it should work just fine. Um, the reason that the, the dipole actually even works as a fan dipole is because the feed point impedance at a resonant antenna at the frequency you're operating is at about 70 ohms. If you are 
operating at a different frequency than than that, then the antenna actually presents a high impedance. So let's say you're you're going to uh, uh, drive the the 20 meter element on 20 meters. If you switched over to 40, or rather, if you if you think about electrically, what's the 40 meter element doing? The 40 meter element looks like a high impedance to that feed point. So it electrically switches off essentially. So it's kind of a, a magical thing that works to our benefit that it simply works without any fancy schmancy electronics in the middle. It just, it just works. In other words, the energy is looking to most efficiently couple to the radiating elements and it'll, most of the energy will wind up being on the resonant elements. So that's basically a fan dipole. It, it's really a pretty simple idea. It's like a big uh, bow tie shape of wires emanating from a feed point. Um, I said you could actually hook the coax straight up to the um, to the antenna wires or whatever that antenna is built out of, but a better practice is to use a ballon at the feed point. What a ballon is is it's typically a one to one transformer, which is really essentially a current choke that takes the unbalanced feed line and mates it to the balanced antenna. What it will do is it'll distribute the voltages and currents. Uh, symmetrically on the radiating elements, so it, they'll it'll work better essentially uh, at the end of the day. So a lot of times you'll you'll see some people will hook up just the wire to the coax and go, hey, it works. Somebody else will put a ballon in the middle and go, oh, this is much better. And then you kind of wonder, well, why did that guy need a ballon, but this other guy didn't? You know what? You know what? And, and the truth of the matter is, they'll all work. What you can't really see is how efficient it is or what the distribution of the voltages and currents are on the radiating element because it's you can't see it. So there is some effect of using um, a feed point like a, uh, a ballon. Now there's other antennas, by the way, that where the impedance is not the same or close to the feed line. Maybe you have an off center fed dipole where the feed point impedance is actually higher. It's like 200 ohms. Well, you need a, a transformer that's not one to one. You need a four to one. You need something that'll transform the uh, the impedance to the the proper value to get the energy transferred properly get a right match to the antenna okay, great uh joe go ahead i got a, a couple questions while we're building this dipole for our our, our listeners george um can you tell us about the size of the wire and and then about swr for that particular antenna you're building here yeah, that's a good question, Joe. This comes up uh, quite a bit because, <clears throat> you know, you, you can imagine why different size of wire makes a different mecha difference mechanically or visually, but does it make a difference electrically? So the truth of the matter is that the size of the wire will have an effect on the tuning of the antenna and the, and the narrow or broadness of the antenna. But in order to see that effect, the diameter of the radiating element has to be such a huge percentage of a wavelength that you would never do it. So the, the, the practical reality is that the wire diameter has no practical effect. So if I were going to string up a very stealthy antenna with some 26 gauge wire, or if I was going to use a, you know, a big piece of 12 gauge Romex that I had sitting around, you would see no difference really in the, in the elements. It's all mechanical or visual. You know, you might say, well, I could get away with that stealthy little 26 gauge. My neighbors will see the Romex, so I'm not going to do that. Or, or you might say, well, this thing's got to withstand, you know, crazy weather. 26 gauge wire is just going to snap in a wind. So I'm going to put up some, you know, hard drawn copper 14 gauge wire and build a real antenna that I expect to survive over the winter. Those are all mechanical decisions. They have zero effect electrically. So what about the uh, SWR? Should we be worried about that with a dipole antenna? You know, I think ha new hams are, are completely preoccupied by SWR. They're completely like, you know, oh my God, I've got to get a one-to-one -one SWR or this thing isn't going to work. And of course, that's a fallacy. So when we talk about SWR from a practical point of view, an SWR less than two-to-one is fine like if you look at any commercial antenna, every antenna manufacturer will rate their antenna at an at a SWR of 1.5 to one or better. Now, almost every antenna when you tune it will probably be better than that at the frequency you tune it for. Depending on how broadband the antenna is, it'll get worse and worse as you move away from that center frequency, depending on the antenna. Some are more broadband, some are more narrowband. 
Um, so generally speaking, my, my, my advice, especially to new guys, is like, you know, if you're going to put an SWR bridge or an antenna analyzer on your antenna and you're less than two to one, you're fine. There's nothing to really worry about. If you get much above two to one, then you should probably have a tuner, assuming that your antenna is resonant. Now, obviously, if you cut your antenna and you cut it too short or too long for the band you want, well, you should have cut it right. So you should go back and, you know, snip it down or add wire or do whatever you have to do to yeah. get it right. But um, I, I really, I think, uh, Mike, you mentioned in the, like, in the old days, we would just tune our transmitter. And, you know, this is a funny thing because this is a phenomenon that's completely lost on newer hams. Um, it, in the old days, like when I was a novice, we didn't have solid state transmitters. We all had all tube transmitters. Even the brand new ones were solid state receivers and tubes in the driver and final stage. In the final stage, you had a, a, a grid uh, in, a, in a load and or rather a plate in a load and you'd have to adjust the, the tuning. That was like having a little t antenna tuner built in. You were really matching the um, the transmitter to the feed line. That's the reason why you only had a tuner if you had some crazy like random wire antenna. If you just had an antenna that was like close enough, you, you, you'd tune it out with your yeah. transmitter. Um, nowadays, that's been replaced by an automatic tr uh, antenna tuner built into the radios. But mostly, except for some a few exceptions, those are only three to one tuners, meaning they'll tune from 25 to 150 ohms. So that'll trim an antenna that's close enough. But if you've got a real random antenna, you need a better tuner than that. Yeah, Mike, I, go ahead. yeah I do think, though, um, what, I, what I understood Joe to be asking is if you're building a dipole and you're putting it up, um, I always build them just a little bit long. And then I check them, you know, when you check it across the band and I, I think it is worth adjusting to get the lowest SWR in the part of the band that you like to operate. And it's, you know, with a, with a wire antenna, that's quick and easy to do. You just keep shortening it until you get it to where you want. And then you, you know, you tighten up the ends and leave it at that. You know, that, that, that's very good advice. Uh, one of the things that is a huge plus for a dipole or any kind of full size wire antenna is that, if the radiating element is where it's resonant at its full size, it, it will be more broadband than an yes. inductively loaded antenna. So sometimes you'll see, let's say a, a, a loaded dipole, you know, it's wire with a coil in the middle and some more wire. And the whole thing is shorter than a half wavelength to get it mechanically shorter. Well, one of the, the price you pay for that is that that antenna will be more narrow band, meaning that if you tuned a, just a piece of wire to be a half wave at the middle of the band, you can go to either end of the band, at least on 40 through 10, you can go to the end of the bands and you're close enough, 80 meters, maybe not so good, but 40 meters and up, you can go to the edges, you're fine. If you stick an inductor, a coil in the middle of that wire to mechanically shorten it, so maybe that 40 meter dipole goes from 66 feet to 45 feet or something like that, what's going to happen is, is as you get to the end of the band, your SWR will be a lot higher than if it was just a wire without that coil. So the coils do cause the antennas to really narrow up. An extreme example is um, if you've ever seen like a 4BTV or 5BTV, uh, it's, a, it's a trapped vertical antenna. Hustler, they've been making them for 50 years. If you want to operate that vertical antenna on 80 meters, you put a uh, coil on the top. And on 80 meters, that thing has got like a, about a 25 to 50 kilohertz bandwidth. It, it's super sharp. Now, 80 meters is, is 500 kilohertz wide, <laughs> but you've, you've got like 50. So it's, you know, the, the more inductive loading you've got, the narrower the, the bandwidth of the antenna. Then you got to tune it out with a tuner and all that becomes somewhat inefficient. So, Mike, the idea is that we've got this dipole that's in the air and it's straight. So... With some, but does it have to be straight? Can I can I bend it? Can I droop it? Can I? Any anything you put up will work. Some things will work better than others. Um, ideally, you want it straight, horizontal, in the clear, at least a half wave up in the air. In real life, you put up whatever you can put up. Um, for many years, my my entire antenna farm was a Radio Shack push-up mast. They, 
uh, 36 foot push up masks. They sold them for TV antennas. You could buy it at Radio Shack for 20 or 25 bucks. And then a, a little piece of wood on the top sticking out horizontally about a, a foot to get the feed pointed away from that pole. I, I always fed, I fed mine with open wire and we'll get into that later. And then if I had a yard with no trees, well, it was an inverted V. The end sloped down an upside down letter V. The end sloped down maybe to a fence or a, a tree or a bush or whatever was convenient. Oh, and if the yard's not big enough, well, I might have to go around a corner and go over this way for a couple of feet. Um, you know, you, you, you put it up, you put up whatever will fit. Um, if you're doing a coax fed dipole, the, the length does need to be very close to a half wave, uh, in order for it to work. Um, I don't, I don't know if we want to get into open wire feeders yet or not, or you want to save that for a little later. Well, yeah, we will. Okay. We'll save that for later then. <laughs> I uh, add, George has something here. Yeah. I want to add on uh, two things. Uh, Mike, first off, you're describing my novice antenna. My, when I got my novice license, <laughs> it was a radio shack, 30 foot TV telescopic mast with a, with a, like a table leg stuck in the, in the top with the, you know, the <laughs> feed point at the top and copper wire. Yeah. Um, and it was a great antenna for, for 40 and 15 meters. Uh, it, it, it was, it was a great antenna. Now, one thing about wire antennas is uh, there's a kind of a big split between uh, those who can put up uh, big wire antennas and those who can't. Let me, let, me, let me just mention what I mean by that. If you have space and you have multiple supports, you could do things like a G5 RV or a conventional dipole because you have two supports that are able to hold the antenna up at a decent elevation. In a suburban lot, that's really hard to come by. And what I found is, and really, I thought of this when you started describing your inverted V, uh, the inverted V is a great way to have effectively a dipole, but with only one support. And the performance of the inverted V will be pretty much the same as the dipole for the most part. And uh, you can get away with a single support. So on a typical suburban lot, you could probably get one pole up in the air in the middle of the property, but you're probably not gonna get two 30 foot tall poles on two ends of the property. Plus in the middle, you have to drop the feed line down from the center of the dipole. And it just kind of looks you know, fairly unpleasant to your neighbor. So um, I, I think the inverted V is a real winner. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the uh, other antennas I wanted to bring up was, um, I, it, this was four or five years ago, um, and Joe and his wife and I were having chili, as we sometimes do, and I was whining because, you know, I couldn't get on 160, and I knew there was a big, you know, 160 year coming up, and this is at the bottom of the sunspots, and, uh, I, you know, what can I possibly put up, and Joe said, you got, you got 250 feet of wire, and I said, yeah. We'll put up an inverted L. Oh, that won't radiate. It won't do this. It won't do that. And he went through the mechanics and I put it up and, and doggone if I didn't in that first winter, uh, didn't get uh, 50 some uh, DX countries on 160, which stunned me. I, I I was just shocked. So Joe, that's that's been, you have an uh, inverted V right? Or, I'm sorry, a uh, um, inverted L right now on 160, right? That is correct. Yes, that's what I use on 160. So uh, what's your thoughts on, on an uh, inverted L, George? I think the inverted L is a great antenna if you can make it long enough. So I, I think they're, uh, it, it's one of those antennas where, you, you know, to Bill's point, you don't expect a lot, but they do work really well as long as you can get it uh, long enough. Yeah, I think they're a great choice. We, we should probably back up just a step. Um, okay. An inverted L is a quarter wave vertical fed against ground. Um, and you, so you need either radials on the ground or elevated radials. So it's, uh, as opposed to a dipole, it's a, it's a vertical antenna and you, you go up as high as you can conveniently go. And then you bend over the rest of the antenna and run it horizontally. So it looks like an L lying on its side or an upside down L as, um, and the two halves of the antenna are not a, equal like they are in a dipole. So one half of the antenna is the wire going up and then out. And then the other half is your, uh, is your radial field, whether it's in the ground or above the ground. I had one on 160, um, two, two houses ago. 
Um, and it worked very, very well. Um, it, you know, it's, if, if you get a good radial field, uh, it can be a very, very effective antenna. So you, even so, though you say it's a, it's a vertical antenna, but in, in many cases, most of the actual radiating element is horizontal. A lot that's of times correct. You, can get, you can get it maybe, like you said, like 30 feet or so, and the other right. like 50 feet of it is going to be horizontal. So it tends to be, you know, horizontal. No, but the high, the high current portion of the antenna is at the feed point. Um, so most of the radiated energy is, is still vertically polarized. Right. So, and that means that your ground system is really important. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I, I did some playing around with that because I had 60 feet vertical and then 160 feet out, uh, roughly, mm -hmm. I think something like that. And when I went from 460 meter radials to 860 meter, what a difference. Uh, it was funny though, when I went from eight to 16, it wasn't as notable. I, of course, I left the 16 out, but uh, it, it wasn't as noticeable as I went from four to eight. So it was interesting. How long were your radials? Uh, they were, uh, gosh, off the top of my head, they were 200 plus feet. Okay, that's good. Yeah, and then two of them went over in my neighbor's yard, but they didn't ever, ever complain, and it was in winter anyway. So, um, so who here has had experience with um, uh, loops, whether it's horizontal or delta or, or uh, okay? Let's talk about loops then, Mike. Another form of wire antenna. Okay, I have one up right now. Uh, one of my eighty meter antennas is a it's a delta loop. It's a, a triangle. Um, uh, with the with the point up in the air and the the bottom wire is about ten feet off of the ground, I feed it with open wire line so that I can tune it anywhere on any band. Um, and uh, it's it's a very very effective antenna for eighty, and it works quite well on the higher bands as well. Uh, I have a number of friends who have had who use horizontal loops. They just they live in a wooded area, so they just run a tree around the, or, or, or run a tree, run a tree through the wires, run a wire through the trees around the perimeter of their lot, and they feed it wherever it's convenient, usually with open wire line, um, and they, uh, and they work all bands with that. Um, my antenna is a full wave on eighty, um, so it's a lot of wire. Um, and I, the way I, mine is fed is it's fed to be mostly vertically polarized because I'm, I'm interested in working DX. Um, it was good enough to work for W8X on 80. Um, <laughs> so um, I've, and I, I like it. It's a good antenna. Um, I, I can't compare it directly to a dipole because I, I had a dipole in the same place. I took that down and put the in, the delta loop in its place. Um, but my impression uh, after using it for a couple of years is, is that the delta loop is a little better for DX contacts and the dipole was a little better for local contacts. Um, the dipole was at 90 feet yeah. and that was also fed with open wire. Wow. So bef before we jump to open to the, the various feeders, uh, one thing, an another thing Joe um, has taught, taught, learned me over time. Uh, Joe, you don't own a tuner, do you? No. <laughs> you've got you've got dozens of wire antennas and and all sorts of things, and you don't have a tuner. Uh, no. and so your big HF beams a log periodic, right? Um, but but all your wire antennas are just they come into the basement and come up under the shack, and and off you go. Yes, and, and for the most part, uh, they're all pretty much one-to-one, 1 1 1.2, but I, I do not own a tuner. I always like for the antenna uh, to work. That's just my theory, and um, and that theory seems to work for me, so that's what, that's what counts, I guess. Yeah, so what has been your experience with, with various feed lines? What do you prefer and, and why maybe? It's kind of a loaded question because of basics, the antenna and the band and everything, but. Who's the question for? You, Joe. You, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, for, or for me. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. So um, I've got big uh, two and a quarter inch hard line uh, that's on my log periodic. 
Uh, it should be on 432, but but I got a spool of it for nothing. So obviously, I I put it in the I put it in my trailer, my dump truck and trailer, and brought it home. So, but most of mine is all um, uh, RG8 cables. Some is RG8X, uh, um, and and I'm not bragging, but I sort of do pretty good with you know with with my setup. And and I'm not competing with anyone, just myself. I put it up, try to get it to work properly. And if I can go out and get DXCC or whatever, I'm I'm just tickled to death. Or like Mike, if I can work a, a new country, I'm 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 a happy camper. So George, how do you uh, what what kind of coaching would you give the people that are okay? I'm going to get into this antenna thing. Do I want? You know, I've got 300 ohm twin line. I got 50 ohm. I can get 75 from the, you know, I know a guy that works with a cable company and I can get, I can get this and that, you know, how, how do we want to approach that? Well, I, I think there is that scenario where I can get it for free. So that changes the equation a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'll give you an example. A good friend of mine uh, got a whole mess of uh, 75 ohm cable and uh, actually two friends and, and they use it because it's either free or super cheap. And um, it's fine. The only, I the only thing I wouldn't use it for is really high power, but for low power or just receiving antennas, it's great. Um, I think for me, especially for newer hams, I would only install coax. I would never use uh, open wire feeder unless you really want to experiment and learn and, and understand how that works. In which case, like, you know, sure, that's great. Um, I think it's something that is, is good if you know what you're doing. Um, but otherwise, it's just kind of a little more fiddly, especially if you run it, run power. And in theory, open wire line is self-shielding, but it is not really. Um, but of course, you can argue whether there's common mode current on coaxial feed lines. So what's the difference? So, I mean, OK, um, you could probably go back and forth philosophically on that. But just from an ease of use uh, perspective, uh, all the commercial antennas you buy are really intended to be used with, with coaxially fed um, feed points. And so that's probably the easier way to go. Um, once you start going into like, okay, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I've got some experience under my belt and I'm going to start messing around with different kinds of antennas and, and try an open feed line that's actually very efficient, that's it's relatively low loss, um, then yeah, I mean, I think it'd be a great thing to try out. I think it also goes back to, uh, do you have a suburban lot or, are you, or do you have acreage? Because I think um, from a practical point of view, uh, running open... Uh, wire or window line or anything that is not um, coax becomes more kind of a little bit more problematic, either from a mechanical point of view or from an RFI point of view. So I, I'm really curious, Mike, if if you ever had any any issues with it or has it been worked really well for you? Yeah, I, I think you and I are going to have to agree to disagree on this one, George. <laughs> I am a huge fan of open wire line. Um, and that's based on my experience. Um, first, I'll back up to, you know, okay, Joe does not own an antenna tuner, but how many acres do you have, Joe? Um, you know, ideally, it, it would be, yes, ideally, we have a resonant antenna for every band that doesn't, and we don't need a tuner. Um, most of us are not that fortunate and and the kind of guys who are interested mostly in wire antennas, and especially somebody just starting out, we need to keep it simple. I've, um, I discovered open wire line after I had been a ham maybe for two years. Um, I was in school. I was renting a room on the third floor of a big house. The landlord let me put a antenna on the roof, a dipole, an inverted V. I had a pole strapped to the chimney, and the wires went down to um, a tree in the front yard and the garage in the backyard. He said, yeah, that's okay. You can do that. And I ran the coax in. It, it kind of laid on the roof and then went up the chimney. Um, th there's a point to this story, by the way. Um, and it worked fine. It was a fan dipole fed with 80, and then I had 40 and 20 going off underneath it. And it and then after about a month, it wasn't working so well. It, signals were just way, way, way down. 
So I climb out at a dorm room window. I could climb out on the roof and go up there. And I look, and there's all these tooth marks in the, in, in the cable. Well, there were squirrels running around up on the roof. They chewed on it. Oh, gee. So, oh, good grief. What do I do now? Somebody says, well, try open wire line. You just, you know, to keep it up on the air and you get one of those little standoff insulators. Okay, fine. So I built, um, I found plans and built a little homebrew tuner with plug-in coils for the different bands and link coupling. Um, and I, I ran the open wire line in and I only needed one wire and I could tune it on every band. And it worked, it worked very, very well. And I could tune it anywhere in any band. Um, I still had a, a tube gear then. I had, I had some old Drake gear. Um, but with my little antenna tuner, I could, I could tune that antenna anywhere. So I started to do more reading and more research. Um, open wire line is extremely efficient even at a very, very high SWR. You, you need laboratory grade equipment to measure the loss in open wire line. Um, but George, what you said, you're absolutely correct. Mechanically, it's more fussy. Um, you need to treat it well. You need to keep it away from anything metal and you need to be very careful on how you run it into your station. And, and that's not always convenient. It's not always possible to do. Um, but for the cases where it is possible, I, I have open wire line going out here. I have a 1500 watt amp sitting here. It works just fine. Um, and I have, I have always, since that time, I have always had at least one open wire antenna in my station. Um, for many years, that was the only antenna I had. Um, and, and I could work all bands and I will... I will make what's going to sound like a very bold um, and presumptuous statement. The, the simple open wire dipole is the most efficient multi-band antenna you can have. Um, you need a good tuner, something like the old Johnson Matchbox that was designed to work into open wire line. It's extremely efficient. But like George says, the the open wire line is fussy to work with. You have to be very, very careful with it. Um, I like it. And um, I have, I mean, I have beams on every other band, um, you know, 40 on up. But uh, I, I always want to have an open wire line antenna for a, a backup for all bands in my station. So, Mike, Mike, you missed one of the other benefits to the open wire. Okay. Yeah especially if you're running the kilowatt, because when you key down, you'll blast the squirrels off your feed line and they're never going to chew into that thing. No, they never did. That doesn't do that. <laughs> but I wish it would. And, and, and it, you can't melt the ice off of it that way either. That's one other disadvantage to open wires is when it gets covered with ice, you have to retune your antenna. So let me ask you a question. Do you use the, like the traditional 470 or so 600 ohm, ladder line or, or more of that plastic window? Um, not, now all you can find is the plastic window line. I, I had some of the, the true open wire line. Um, theoretically, the true open wire line is more efficient than the, the plastic coated window line. But again, I think you'd need some pretty fancy equipment to measure that. So mine is, um, it's, yes, yeah, the window line, the brown plastic. Um, you can get it from RF Connection or the Wireman or probably plenty of other places. You know, it's funny when you said the old Johnson tuner, all four of us were shaking our head like, yeah, I remember that. I'd love to have one of those. I, I have two of them. <laughs> so, it, so it sounds like so far the discussion's really been, it's all about trade-offs, right? You, you, you've yes. got to trade off efficiency and size and cost and everything else. Well, one thing I'm curious about, George, is is you you got into Pac-10, and and I went through their website the last couple of days. There's a lot of creative things out there. How what do you think you have learned, maybe that was has changed your perspective, or um, I'm not sure how I want to word this, but like with all these trade offs, and you've got these products that are, I th I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, is that you're you're marketing like Poda and Soda and that kind of stuff, right? So, so there's got to be a huge number of trade-offs you have to make there. So 
what what kind of things have you learned going through that process? Uh, boy, a lot, um, a, a lot of things. I think a part of it is is I learned on the technical side which antennas. Is there really a difference? Do do like uh, we make three different HF antennas? We make a link dipole, we make an NFED random wire, and an NFED half wave. They all work fine. And and we one of the questions I get a whole lot is well, you know, which is the best antenna? And it's like, well, I hate to say it, but it well it sort of depends. It's it, it my the sort of the the joking analogy is it's like saying which is the best golf club. If I was only going to buy one golf club, which it's like well. <laughs> I really, that's a hard question to answer, you know, which is the one club you should buy, I guess a seven iron, but it makes for a terrible putter. Um, so let alone a driver. So, you know, the, the answer for, for what my customer base really wants, which is portability. The answer is, is in certain circumstances, some antennas are, are better than others. Um, I think they all perform about as well as each other. I mean, technically there's a little bit of a difference, but it kind of washes out. In, in practical use. Uh, and it's really more mechanical. W what's a more convenient antenna to set up? How much space do you have? Are you setting up on asphalt or on grass? Are you hiking with it? Or are you going to drive up to your site? And all these things will be kind of uh, trade-offs. Um, the one observation I, I would have is that the most popular antenna, I would say by far, is the NFED half wave. Um, now, when I first started making them, the most popular one was the random wire antenna. So I think the the only reason I can figure out why is that when I first started selling these antennas about six, seven years ago, the most popular field radios were the Elecraft KX2, KX3, and they have very wide range tuners. And with a random wire antenna, you can be on any band with a flick of a button, the, the antenna just works. And um, what we've seen in the last three, four, five years is a lot of new QRP radios don't have tuners. So the ICOM 705 doesn't have a tuner. The um, Lab 599TX500 does not have a tuner. Uh, older radios like the, uh, you know, Yesu uh, 817, 818, 857, 897, all those uh, didn't have tuners built in. So uh, people are now gravitating more towards the resonant antennas because you need a tuner with the random wire. So I, it's funny how the fashion of which are more popular kind of changes with what's the most popular radios, I think or at least there's a, there's a correlation there. Um, for me personally, I like the random wire antenna the best because it's the fastest thing to set up and tear down and I could put it anywhere. I could put it in a, on, in a vertical configuration without taking up any space. I could stretch it out. Um, I can make it short and I make it long. I can change bands instantly because I just use a tuner. <laughs> it works great. Yeah. So, um, Anyway, I think those are some of the things I learned, not so much the technical stuff. You know, these antennas, the funny thing is, these antennas are, are you know, the, the design of the antennas electrically are, you know, date from the 30s. I mean, this is not like new technology. So it's it, the difference between my antennas and anybody else's or building it yourself is just mechanically how you did it. And what we really optimized for was not the clever electrical design, because there's nothing special about the electrical design. It's the mechanical design. So if you are trying to optimize for portability, what do you care about? You care about size, you care about weight, and you care about performance because your radio is probably going to be low power as well. So I'd say 80% of my customers are QRP operators. And so a full size antenna makes a huge difference. A, a lot of the commercial antennas that are pitched to QRP operators are loaded antennas, which is to me, it's just a pointless. Like, why would you do that? Because you, especially on like 40 meters, my favorite bands are 20 and 40. So 40 meters, you want a nice quarter wave, at least 33 feet. If you have a little five foot radiating element with a big coil in the middle, it's not going to be very efficient, but it'll tune, but it's not going to be very efficient. So we really optimize for maximum performance and minimizing the size and the weight. And that really drives all of our design and manufacturing decisions. And then the, I guess the other part is, is uh, we, we optimize to build the antenna that we want to use ourselves. Uh, we don't optimize for price. So you could build all this stuff out of cheap stuff and it'll work, but it might break. And so we really try to build stuff very high quality out of the materials that we would want ourselves to use because we use it ourselves. I mean, I, I started out building all these antennas because I wanted them for myself. I bought every commercial uh, portable HF antenna I could lay my hands on 
and uh, some are better than others, but none of them were as portable as what I really wanted. So that's what really drove our decisions. Okay. Um, Joe, what is the portable antenna that, and, and it's not really a wire antenna, I know that, but there's a portable antenna you take with you uh, to the Bahamas. It's a um, TW antenna. Um, it was a um, guy by the name of Mike Barrett started it and then he sold it. It's been sold a couple of times and now DX Engineering, uh, uh, you know, produces and, and sells them. And um, so the, I've got three of them. And they really work good. They're better than some, worse than others, you know, sort of a typical antenna. But the one box goes 10 to 20. You can set it up in five minutes would be ideal for um, uh, POTA. I don't know that I'd want to pack it up on a mountaintop, but you could, you know, if you had a strong enough guy. So I really like those antennas. Then I have boxes for uh, uh, 30, 40, and 60. And and the guy was gonna develop a 80 meter, but he was gonna have to change the complete frame because he just needed more more area. I, I knew you'd work 60 meters in here somehow. He, um, Joe's kind of <laughs> considered the, uh, he's kind of considered the grandfather of 60 meters. Um, I like 60 come- meters, George. He, he will contact every D expedition going out. Why aren't you on 60 meters? Did you really think our club would donate? <laughs> yeah. So but, I knew you'd work it in somehow. So Mike, what have I forgot? You know, I have a, I have a good friend, Bob, uh, K8AAC. He's, he's recently licensed, um, incredibly strict HOA. Um, but he does have a big attic that I can, and I'm six nine, and I can stand up in it. So um, I'm thinking... <laughs> Van Dipole, I'm thinking, what what should I be thinking? Okay. Um, well, there is one thing we have not covered. Okay. Uh, let's do that and that is the, the off-center fed dipole. Um, that's, uh, people like to call them Wyndham antennas, but they really aren't. The Wyndham antenna is a single wire feed. Um, and if, if you guys want a history lesson and want to spend some time, I could go on and on about that because I, I found it rather fascinating, but it doesn't have a lot of use in today's world. Um, I think the off-center fed dipole can be a very effective multi-band antenna. Um, it is not as good on any single band as a single center fed dipole, but but I think as a multi-band antenna, it, it can be very effective, very simple, and you don't have the problem of trying to get open wire line into your shack. Um, there's a, there's a, some very, very good information on them out on the web, um, W8JI, W8JulietIndia.com. Um, if you want information on antennas, don't go and look at the people that are selling it to you, except for George, of course. Um, (laughs) and even then, (laughs) yeah, but you know, you know, these guys are making their living at it. So they, they, they're going to tell you it's the best thing in the world. Uh, Tom W H J I is a brilliant engineer. He likes to take things apart and see what makes them go. And he has an excellent way of explaining some very technical topics um i years ago he he was did a lot of work on drake sea lines and i I had one at the time and i used to pick his brains i'm not a technical guy i'm a musician Um, he was able to explain stuff to me so i could understand it anyway he has good information so the you take an off-center fed dipole, and, and George, you mentioned this earlier, if you, if you feed it off-center, the impedance is closer to 200 ohms. Um, and it's pretty close to 200 ohms on a lot of bands. So you can have a simple coax-fed dipole with a four-to-one ballon at the feed point, and it will work well on several bands. Um, I, I think that for, for people who can only put up one wire antenna and you know you can hide them in the trees you can uh you know it's easier to hide um so i i think that that is something 
uh, worth looking into. Uh, if and, and especially if the the way your yard is set up is more convenient than than having a something fed in the middle, you know, if it's easier to run your feed line in. Um, but I, um, a couple of us recently put one up for uh, for one of the locals, an old timer here, and the way his yard was set up, he had he had a lot of room in one direction and not much room in the other direction, and there was only one place we could run the uh, coax in. So uh, I, I built one up and tested it here at home and and uh, used it for a while. And I said, hey, this works pretty well. And we put it up. He was very, very happy with it. So I think, um, please don't call it a Wyndham, but the, the, the off-center fed dipole, I, I, I think, uh, is, is a good multi-band antenna for people who cannot or don't want to use open wire line. Well, so Mike, sure. I, I wouldn't be a good editor of the club newsletter if I didn't say that all of your research on the Wyndham would really come together and make a good article for our newsletter. I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah. Well, it. <laughs> I, I don't know who would be interested in it. Um, I don't know if you want to take time on that now, um, but it's it. I found it fascinating. But the, you know, the single wire feed, they're, they're feeding it directly out of the tank circuit on the transmitter. And, and it's, it's a single wire going up to a, a horizontal wire. Um, you know, I looked at it, I thought, well, it's just, it's just a top loaded vertical because it's, it's all one wire. Um, but when I read his article, I realized, well, no, it really isn't because that top wire is a half wave long. And and they move the end, they move the feed point back and forth un, until they find the place where they have the lowest standing wave on the feed line, and the best current distribution on the wire. No, wait, this is 1929. How did they figure that out? They didn't have Easy Neck. They didn't have computer modeling. They put a remote ammeter on the wire, pulled it back and forth with pulleys and strings and looked through a surveyor's transit to read the currents. Okay, that, that's what these guys did. That's, that's how that Wyndham antenna was developed. That's crazy. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> See, that, would, that would be interesting. Go ahead, Joe. I got a question for George. Um, <laughs> why are beams? I don't, uh, I don't have one, never been around one. So what's your take on that, George? Oh, good question. I, I personally don't uh, have never had a wire beam at the house, but I've used them on field day um, and th they can be super effective if if you have enough vertical supports uh, to really hold hold the stuff up. Uh, but you could do, you know, you could do a ver like a vertical wire beam or you can do a horizontal one just depends on wh what you have for the construction. But yeah, they could be uh, very effective, especially since uh, you don't. You can make full uh, size elements. You don't have to uh, and wide space it. You don't have to constrain the the uh, the element spacing and the and the loading that you have to do for a lot of yagis because you have to mechanically make it, you know, reasonable to hold up with a single support. So yeah, they could be great. They're, they're just tough to steer, I imagine. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a point. Um, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to go back to something that you mentioned, Bill, um, before we were talking about the Wyndham, which you mentioned attics. Yes. And um, um, things are not always black and white when it comes to RF. However, um, I think putting an antenna in the attic is the absolute last thing you would ever do. Um, it, it's the sort of the last ditch antenna. And mainly because for most of us, putting in an antenna in the attic causes more RFI issues or self-induced noise uh, problems. So a lot of times, uh, if you could put a wire, a stealthy wire outside, even if it's just like on top of the roof, you know, maybe even su suspended a little bit, that will be way better than putting it inside uh, the attic itself. Now, I, I realize that the, the, depending on the material your roof is made out of, it shouldn't make a difference, but it always seems to. So I would I would get the wire out of the attic if I could possibly do it. Um, if I were in a situation where it's absolutely impossible to do that, then yeah, okay, sure. You know, put a wire in the antenna and zigzag it around and do what you got to do um, to to make it work. But 
uh, man, the, the closer you are to uh, cables and, you know, security systems and phone lines and all that, man, you're just asking for trouble. Um, if you're running QRP in the attic, you're probably fine. But if you're running any power, ooh boy, you're really begging for a lot of RFI challenges. And um, the other thing I'd suggest is if you're putting the antenna outside, but you can't put up something like the um, um, off-center fed dipole, because that has to be about a half wave, right, on on the lowest frequency you're on. Yes, it so does. If you want, if you want to be on forty, you know, you need sixty-six feet of space. And if you have the space, then then that's great. Like the fellow you're talking about that had. Uh, a long shot in one direction, so perfect for a uh, yeah. for that kind of antenna. That he's lucky. That's great. Um, if you could only put up, let's say, forty feet, you know, or something like that, uh, you could just put up a uh, random wire antenna and use a tuner. Um, if you operate QRP, you will have no problem at all. I mean, you're really not going to cause any RFI at five or ten watts, or even maybe twenty watts. If you get up to 100 watts, it's it's kind of dicey. You know, you may cause interference, you may not. If you do, maybe you could fix it with some toroids placed on your speakers or whatever the thing is getting interfered with. But um, I think the the order of preference for me would be outside full size resonant antenna number one, whatever that kind of antenna is. Absolutely. The next one down would be a a a random tuned antenna that's physically shorter. Um, as best as you can put it outside. And then my third choice would be, okay, put it in the attic. <laughs> if you've got nothing else. Actually, there's one worse than put it in the attic, which I used myself. So we, when we were in the process of moving from California to Oregon, we lived in an apartment for a few months. And so I had a, uh, uh, an Alex loop, a magnetic loop on a photo tripod inside the apartment in the sliding glass door frame. Mm -hmm. Really? And, um, and I was running five Watts on a, um, IC 705 and I, w I was making plenty of FT8 contacts. Now I, you, you couldn't do a sideband contact to save your soul, but you could do FT8 and you could probably squeeze in a, an odd CW contact or two. So, you know, it depends on, you know, that, see, that's another part of it too. Like we talked about at the top of the show, if you are in a constrained antenna environment, you can look at other things. Uh, usually, if you're constrained from an antenna point of view, you're probably constrained in terms of power. You're not going to run a kilowatt in your mm -hmm. dipole in the attic. You're just going to light up every piece of electronics in the neighborhood. Uh, but if you're operating modes where you have a, a, you can operate very low power effectively, CW, digital modes, then you've got a fighting chance of actually having a good time. Well, I, I realize because I know where Bob lives and, and they allow Christmas lights over there. So I'm thinking yeah. if we get up on the guise of Christmas light and we 3D print some eight or nine inch spacers, we might be able to run something off the roof, nine or 10 inches. We'll put it up now while the Christmas lights are up and just forget to take it down in the spring and see how, <laughs> how it works, right? And, so, if, and if you do it right, they'll blink when uh, with the modulation of your transmitter. Yeah. <laughs> see, one of these TW antennas that we're getting off the, I'm getting off the subject, but one of these TW antennas would work fine because you could hang a couple bird feeders on it. So and the funny we'll, thing, those, you know, those TW, the, the, when I first saw that thing, I thought there's no way this is going to work. Yeah. Um, but, but I know guys who've used them quite successfully. And, and so they're, they're, they're one of those, like, does that really work kind of antennas? So they're quite interesting um, yeah. and they do not look like an antenna. So you can just put it in your front yard and it's like, yep, no problem. HOA won't bother you. So, I mean, that is an antenna you could literally put anywhere, you know, out, you know, save for inside your third story apartment. Uh, you could put it, you know, any place outside, it'd be fine. So how, how frustrating was that for you to be in an apartment for a temporary amount of time? And, you know, you're not, I mean, I guess you adjust everything, but it's kind of like, ah. You know, I, I had, I, I had one bag with my radio gear for the, all the other radio stuff was in a big container. So I, I had my little lifeboat of radios that I took with me <laughs> and I had a little lifeboat of a workbench with tools and <laughs> instruments that I took with me. So I had plenty to do. So a couple of months, no problem. But you know, if I had to do that for a year, I would, uh, I don't know, that'd be pretty dismal. It'd be crazy. Well, so Mike, what did I forget? I think we've got everything over my uh, list. Oh, well, you didn't forget anything, but uh, George talking about the apartment and being uh, constrained. Um, and this, this fits because it's a wire antenna. I had a buddy in Germany, um, had an apartment in Berlin, and uh, 
course, he couldn't put up outside antennas, but he had a, a little tiny balcony. He got a great big long fishing pole with a reel on it and uh, wound the reel with uh, some thin wire, put a sinker on the end. And when he wanted to operate, he'd, uh, he'd reel the wire out to whatever band he wanted to get on. He was grounded against the balcony railing and something in his apartment. And, uh, and he'd get on the air. And uh, I was living in Maryland at the time. So, you know, East Coast to Europe is pretty easy. But I, I had plenty of nice chats on, I don't think we ever worked on 80, but all bands 40 and up. And, and this is on CW. And you know, I had a pretty good station. I, I, had, uh, I had beams. Um, but I, I was able to work him with that fishing pole. And then, uh, you know, when he was done operating, he'd just reel the thing in and, and tuck it in and go. So um, where there's a will, there is a way you can right. get on. And it was, it was an effective antenna. And it was a wire antenna, so it fits with the theme of tonight's show. So you know, one other thing to, to think about, too, is th this whole stealthiness is really, that could be a whole episode in its own, right? But one don't thing you have, about, sorry, don't you have a one on stealthy antennas? We do. Up? Well, yeah. I, we did one. We, we, we oh, had you did a, it already. Yeah, we had a really fun episode. So we, we had Kirk Kleinschmidt, who wrote the book mm -hmm. on stealth antennas, literally wrote the book. Um, and so that, and he's really a fun guy to, to talk with. So, yeah, we, we, we talked okay. a bunch about that. Um, one little tip, too, is if you don't mind setting stuff up and taking it down, even if you have a big HOA problem, operating at night mm -hmm. could be your friend because you can go set up stuff in, in the backyard. You know, you could put up a, a fiberglass pole and, you know, a piece of wire in five minutes. Um, or or the, the Transworld antenna you were talking about, Joe. I mean, like you said, it goes up in five minutes. So, so you know, operating at night, you can kind of get away with a lot more than, than in the daytime. So, so that's actually kind of a plus. We have a club member that does that, George. He, yeah. uh, he, he's scared to death of the neighbors. And uh, so he goes out at night and puts up all his little wires and verticals and operates. Yes. Huh. Interesting. That's interesting. So Joe, what did I forget? Not a thing. I went through Mike's list and I went through uh, Bill's list. And uh, I made a couple uh, comments going in, so we're, we're I think we're good. And I and it's way past my bedtime. <laughs> That's right. You have to get up pretty soon. You got to get up at four thirty for the gray line, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is. That's one thing about him, George. He is absolutely religious to the gray line. It's unbelievable. But yeah. the, so, George, what did I miss? What what uh, what? Something else we should have mentioned, or you've got a, mm. a special discount on Edfend antennas for my friend, or <laughs> no chance that that's not happening. Um... Mention the DX Mentor on <laughs> when your order, and you get ninety percent off. <laughs> <laughs> if you place your order through Mike, and he'll subsidize yeah. it, no problem. Um, let's see. Uh, I think we we covered a, a lot of stuff. I guess uh, maybe one other thing is if you're if you're looking to spend money on a piece of equipment. If you look at antenna tuners, there's some really good wide range tuners. And so if you use, uh, if you use wire antennas that are resonant, you don't need to worry about it. But if you're gonna run wires that are non-resonant or random wires in the worst case, then uh, be aware that they're, the tuners in the radios are fairly narrow uh, in most radios. Now there's notable exception, Elecraft radios, for example, have wide range tuners built in. But you know, I, ICOM, Yesu, et cetera, they're all like three to one tuners, which are not really good enough to handle a random wire antenna. But there's a bunch of manufacturers that do make stuff like that, uh, like um, uh, LDG and MFJ, and you know, a bunch of old companies like like Johnson, as you know, you're mentioning before. Uh, but having a good wide range tuner uh, could really make the difference. Uh, you can tune up almost anything. Now realize that just because the transmitter is happy doesn't mean you're getting out very well. That's mm -hmm. a different issue. Uh, but you can at least compensate for the the lousy match. So so getting a good uh, tuner to go with your wire antenna might be a good tip. Okay, great. Boy, what what a lot of ground we covered. A lot of, of, of memories for me. I was thinking back to my early antenna. Like we all were. It sounded like we're all in the same boat. Uh, most of the people I know start out one way or another close to that. So, Joe, you got a follow up? Uh, George, uh, put a plug in for your company. Oh, sure. I, I felt like I already did. <laughs> I'll well, mention it again. Yeah, but do, it, so, 
do it again. Oh, yeah. all right. Thank you. Th- this, thank this, you. This thank will be a shameless that. plug. <laughs> totally shameless. So Pactena, we've been making antennas for about six, seven years. We focus around ultra portable antennas for soda and poda and travel. Um, we've had a lot of customers have bought them and put them up at home and leave them up. Uh, they're not really intended for that, but you could do that. Uh, so we make NFED random wire antennas, NFED half waves, uh, link dipoles. We also came out with uh, a VHF portable antenna mount that you can use a common uh, UHF, VHF whip antennas and use our, our feed point. So we sell the antennas, masts, both carbon fiber and fiberglass masts and, uh, and cables, coax cables. And even the cables are all uh, super lightweight. So we focus on RG316, uh, which is uh, Teflon uh, coated, uh, Teflon in- center insulated coax because it's very abrasive, abrasion resistant, and uh, in, the performance is fine at, at, at each F. Uh, we make inline chokes, uh, especially for the random wire antennas. So uh, all that stuff is at pectenna.com. And right now, as usual, you, you'll go there and find half of the stuff is all sold out. And we're right in the midst of making a whole new batch we should have before Christmas. So uh, we'll be uh, turning the spigot back on to take orders in uh, mid-December. The, yeah. the, the item that jumped out at me uh, is the 10 meter or 32 foot tall mass that collapses to what? 26 inches. 26 inches. Yeah. Jeez. So there's a, there's actually a, a th- that's a very important product uh, because that's what started me on the whole thing. So if you don't mind the rewind in time back, you know, eight, nine years ago. So I bought, like I said, literally every portable antenna that was available for sale, except for, I never bought an Outbacker. That was the only one I never had, but all the other popular ones, I bought one. And um, some of them are really good and some of them are really not. Uh, but the, like, I'll give you an example. A really great built antenna is Buddy Pole. The guys at Buddy Pole, their manufacturing is excellent. They have very high quality material, very good manufacturing. Uh, their support's good. Uh, and I really love the Buddy Pole antennas, except they're too heavy to carry around on the trail. They're really meant for like POTA kind of stuff. Uh, the other thing that I'm not wild about is, is they're inductively loaded, so they're shortened. So you're running five watts and a very heavy inductively loaded antenna, it's like a bad deal. So that's, that's really not their target market. Um, so that's what I got to be thinking, like, well, you know, it's got to be a better way to do this. And uh, when I found a supply of these fiberglass masts that are 10 meters long, so 32 and a half feet roughly, I thought, wait a minute, that's a magic number. 32 feet, 10 meters is a magic number because because my favorite bands, like I said, is 20 and 40. Yep. So, oh my gosh, I could I could take one of those fiberglass masks, run a piece of wire on it, and I get a quarter wave on 40. Full size quarter wave on 40. I don't need a tuner. It's very efficient. And this is awesome. And so that's what started the whole pack 10 thing was that mast. Because when it collapses down to 26 inches, I can pop that in my backpack or strap it to the side, no problem. So that was the, uh, the the origin of trying to figure out the antenna system that would would maximize that that uh, mast. So is that essentially fourteen or fifteen concentric pipes that? Yep, it's seventeen. I think it's seventeen. Okay. Uh, they're they're if you look if you unscrew the bottom and look at it, it is it exactly that. They're concentric uh, fiberglass segments. They're actually very narrowly tapered. If you looked at one, you'd say it looks like a cylinder or a tube. But in fact, the one end is very tiny bit smaller than the other end. And so what happens is when you take, we take the smallest element out, when it gets to the near the end of the tube, it pulls the next one and the next one and the next one. So what you do is you, you pull an element out and you, you hold the two elements and you give it a very slight twist and pull, like maybe a quarter of an inch if that, that just snugs them together and you just take, take as many elements up as you want and use it and when you're all done it all comes back down into uh, the outer case and off you go that's really cool Mm -hmm. very very and and it's big enough for like for a dipole um if you go up to about 21 or 22 feet the diameter is still about a half an inch which is rigid enough to put a feed point attached to it to make a inverted v for example um you could also make a 20 meter ground plane but i normally use it as a v but if you're using a wire then I put a little hook at the top, so a little clip, and I put the end of the wire on that little clip, up it goes. So now I have a 33-foot wire, or you can make a sloper or 
you know, whatever, uh, if you, if you have a long antenna, like, uh, let's say a 40 meter NFED half wave, you could do it as an NFED V where you have the feed point at one end and it goes up to the, the top of the, the mast and then back down to the other side. So that's very easy. Uh, you could, you could guy them in the grass or what I normally do is, is I take a photo tripod. So I've got a, a an aluminum or, or a carbon fiber photo tripod and I, I made a little bracket. Uh, for the top. So a lot of these photo tripods, you can spin the photo head off and you're left with a three eighths inch stud that pops out the top of the, of the tripod if you buy the right tripod. So I made a bracket that slips over that stud and you wing nut it on. And now that you've got a big collar and the mast goes up into that collar and then you put a piece of Velcro uh, strapping on the bottom. So there's two points where it's connected to the tripod and up you go and it's uh, self-supporting. If you're in a windy situation, I take a little nylon bag with some weights in it, hand weights, and just set it on the photo tripod's hook. It pulls the the tripod down because of the weight. It's not going to fall over because it's only holding up a little piece of 26 gauge wire. No problem. Yeah. Very cool. Does does the carbon fiber have any electrical properties? It does. It okay. does. And in fact, when I, I first looked at using carbon fiber masks, I, I really wanted to use them because they're... Um, about half the weight, maybe, maybe better. So it's, it, it, the fiberglass is not bad, but if you're going to do a backpacking trip, they're kind of heavy for backpacking. They're fine for a day hike, but overnight it's kind of, you'd question it. Uh, the carbon fiber is really light. And, and so I did a lot of experiments with the carbon fiber and it turns out um, if you, if you think about the carbon fiber as a piece of metal and treat it accordingly, it'll work just fine. So okay. like you're talking okay. about, Mike, you're talking about the inverted V where you put the insulated right. segment at the top to keep it away from the metal. No problem. In fact, e even on a metal mast, you could, you could put a feed point on the metal and it'll be fine because the elements are coming out tangent to the, right. you know, to the tower or pretty close. That's fine. But if you, if you run the, the antenna wire along the side of the mast, it'll detune it. Now, Got it. The, the bad news, <laughs> the worst news actually is, it doesn't detune it like change the center frequency. It sort of messes up the tuning entirely. So I was hoping if you if you run the wire next to the to the mast, it would just like increase or decrease the resonant point of the wire. But in fact, it really goofs it up. So you can't do that. Um, so what that really means is if you're going to go ultralight with a carbon fiber mast, you're really going to set it up with a, as a sloper, most likely, or an uh, inverted V. But for most of the time, you're going real lightweight, portable, probably an in-fed sloper. Interesting. Very, very cool. <clears throat> and that's um, pactenna.com, and I'll put that in the show notes. Um, and George, I, I, I really want to uh, thank you for your time. But I thought this was really interesting. Uh, Mike as well, and, and Joe, you guys had so much to add, and it's always great with your combined 200 years experience to shed some light on that. So <laughs> I've only been licensed in 71, so I can't I can't really add too much. So, uh, <laughs> But George has been kind enough to stay with us, and I'd say, what about this date? Well, I'm in Japan. What about this date? Well, I can't do it. And we, we finally brought this together, and I couldn't be more appreciative, George. Um, I don't know if you're going to be at Dayton next year or not. I sure uh, hope so. I, I haven't been at Dayton for the last couple of years, mainly because uh, some combo of, of COVID and work, but uh, I'm retired now. So um, I have all the time in the world. So I'm probably going to, I'm certainly going to try to make it this year. Okay. Well, um, you know, if you have an interest, uh, Joe and I are the, the guys that put on the DX dinner. Uh, we'd love to have you come to that and uh, the DX forum on Saturday, but I know you've got a booth and you've got your whole crew, but Joe and I'll track you down. We'll grab Mike because he's always uh, floating around the ARL booth and uh, uh, we'll come over and shake your hand and say thanks. And uh, hopefully we'll get to chat with you again. This was great. Bill, thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm very, really honored to come uh, hang out with you guys and talk about this. Um, I, I always learn a lot. It's it's great to hang out with people that know a lot about different aspects of the hobby and you know give me a chance to learn. And uh, And Joe and Mike, so nice to meet you as well. Thank you. And, and Mike, thanks very much. I know it's wicked cold up there, and uh, you're holding oh, up in space. It's, it's just looking at the thermometer, it's it's up to 18, so it's not so Eight. bad. It was four this morning, <laughs> um, four above. Four above. Um, so as a parting note, um, you can work DX with 100 watts in a wire. Um, it, 
it can be done. And, 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 FT, uh, and, and I know this wasn't the intent, but the digital modes are really a game changer, aren't they? Well, they, yes, because you can hear much weaker signals than you can by ear. Sure. Your but us old fart CW guys don't like them because they're not Morse code. Yeah. <laughs> you sound like George. my father with AM versus sideband. <laughs> George, Art it was versus nice, CW. Uh, hey, it was nice meeting you and... Uh, I thought this presentation went very, very well for a uh, a new ham. He or she should really enjoy this presentation, plus the the soda and the poda guys and girls. For sure, thank you, Joe. So I think we 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 brought a lot to them tonight. Thanks a million, guys. Yeah, thanks well, very fun. much, Joe. Have a good Christmas. If we don't talk, did you learn something? I certainly did. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the DX Mentor. I would especially like to thank our gurus on this podcast, Joe, W-A-G-E-X, Mike, W-0-V-T-T, and George, K-J-6-V-U. I would love to have your feedback, answer your questions, and provide help with any DX or amateur radio issues that you may have. If you need clarification on something or you just have a question, send an email to thedxmentor at gmail.com. Please drop me a line if you've achieved an all-time new one, received recognition, achieved a new plateau like 200 or 300 confirmed, or you have a DX event that you would like us to mention, we would be happy to do that. 7-3 for this episode, and thanks to my XYL, Karen, for her love and support.